your, your talk. Okay, thank you, David, and, and thanks so much for helping to facilitate all the technical issues uh, to, to get this off the ground. Um, I thank you all for joining me this evening. Uh, think of when you're on the plane and, and the uh, flight attendants say, we know you have many choices to fly or you have many choices of other things to do tonight, such as Anthony Fauci throwing out the first pitch at, at, in the Washington Nationals or Taylor Swift, I think, here is dropping a, a new album. So I'm grateful that you're all with me. Um, now, uh, one thing, David, how will do I see the slide presentation? Am I gonna go in speaker view? You're muted. Um, there we go, the screen sharing. Perfect, now we're all set. Okay. So five months ago, I had presented a, uh, pr made this presentation at the Jewish Genealogical and Archival Society of Greater Philadelphia. And it was the last live meeting we had this year because since that time, everything has been virtual. So I figured this was the perfect opportunity to offer this on Zoom as a, um, an encore uh, a, a performance, so to speak. Uh, we title this the Irish Torah uh, and, but it's also combining the Schreider family genealogy and a lot of work that has gone on to in gathering uh, different branches of the family over a, a 10 year period. Okay, David. This is the, uh, what we call the Irish Torah. And we'll be telling the story, uh, but a safer Torah that uh, has been sitting in our Aran Kodesh uh, since about 1983, uh, after my parents had uh, rededicated this following the merger of the of a two congregations. We'll talk about that later. Okay, the, the Irish to Torah, its journey from this town, Ashmiani, and, and there's different spellings that you'll, you'll see of Ashmiani, Ash, Ashmania, et cetera, that this is now currently in Belarus, to Dublin, then to Philadelphia. And the migration of the family to Ashmiani, okay, from the, in the late, that were there in the late 1780s to Dublin, approximately 1885, and to Philadelphia. Two brothers that came, uh, 19, about 1900, was the older uh, brother, uh, Joseph, uh, Schreider, and then Isaac Schreider, my grandfather, came here in 1908 and to Israel in two waves. One of the thing, interesting things is that we found a branch of the family we really didn't know about that were Halutzim that went to Palestine in 1925. And then in 1947, the other remaining family members after they survived uh, the Holocaust. We have a map of the world, and, but on the next uh, page, I copy this again, saying we are all over the map. We're talking about my great-great-grandfather, Moshe Schreider. His children were Elchanan Schreider, who stayed in Ashmiani. Anna Schreider, Isaac's sister, uh, married a Joseph Heyman when they were in Dublin in 1907, and they moved to Glasgow, Scotland, as did other uh, Schreiders from the Matisse Yahoo Schreider families who moved to the UK. So my official start of genealogy research began so, some 10 years ago when I dropped in to, in Philadelphia to the annual International Association of Jewish Genealogical Society, okay? And registered, um, I, I wasn't attending the full program, but I got to a morning program and sometimes there was an evening program. And registered on, the, on their com computers, if they're taking one class, uh, focusing on jewishgen.org. As we move um, uh, forward, uh, I've got a hit immediately. 
But let me digress for a second to, to point out the, what David had posted in the chat room were two of the links regarding this upcoming annual conference that was supposed to be held in uh, August in San Diego, but now it's a virtual conference. So if, if I inspire anybody here uh, this evening to start the process, you know, check out those links and see if there are certain programs that you would want to attend. So here it's August 2009 when I really got underway in my search for family. Okay, the next slide. So I set up a profile, immediately got a hit, but it took me 10 years to finally meet an Israeli cousin who had been somewhat reluctant to accept the relationship over the years, even after my niece, Eva, who's on this uh, Zoom program, had a quick visit with her at Ben Gurion Airport, I'd say about uh, five or six years ago. So on September 5th, 2019, this past year in Jerusalem, I met not one, but two third cousins. On the right is this cousin Ziva Alicia and her sister Dina Cohen. And the next slide, we had to take a selfie where I get in, in the picture as well. Now in March 2017, my brother Elkin and his wife Joan DeVore were going to travel to Israel with a synagogue trip. So I started sending Ziva some emails, uh, but they were bounced back. So I went back to jewishgen.org to see if there was a revised email address for her. And to my surprise, there was another researcher, a history professor in the UK uh, at, uh, at Bradford University by the name of Munro Price. His father was Stanley Price, who was raised in Dublin and the UK, an actor and writer who wrote this book in 2003, Somewhere to Hang Your Hat, An Irish Jewish Journey. Their family descends from the second Schreider brother, Matis Yahu, or Matthew, who went to Dublin in the 1880s, I think uh, maybe a little bit earlier than um, Isaac and his father and sister had gone there. And sadly, uh, I recently saw this notice on his, in his bio that he had passed away last February 28th, and actually that was just two days after Marsha's uh, untimely passing. This was his book that he wrote. And the cover, the back cover, all glowing reviews. Uh, I looked him up in the Wikipedia. Here's his bio. And the next page has a number of uh, references <clears throat> that he uh, wrote and edited many film screenplays. These include co-writer credits on Arabesque, a movie with Sophia Loren and Gregory Peck, Gold, a, a 1974 movie with Roger Moore, as well as John, uh, a James Bond movie. And then there was another Roger Moore movie in 1976 and several other credits uh, that, that he uh, has had earned. And then this book of Somewhere to Hang My Hat. Uh, he writes a bit uh, about James Joyce, um, the, the, you know, and that's also, there was a bit of a chapter in his book concerning uh, the whole story of James Joyce and, the, you know, giving rise to Leopold Bloom. There's that angle that's covered in, in his book. So here's a little profile of Monroe Price, a history uh, professor. Uh, his paternal grandmother was Sarah Schreider, the daughter of Matthew Schreider. This was M Moshe's older brother. And Monroe was kind enough to give me this picture of his great grandfather, uh, Matis Yahu. And this was taken in 1913 in Dublin. Um, about a decade after his wife had passed away, and he was about to embark on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And it turned out that he, um, the story that 
uh, Monroe had told me is that he had passed away en route to the Holy Land and wound up being buried in um, Alexandria, Egypt. Okay. And then we can go on. Now, however, uh, we have to introduce Eddie a, a little a bit from now, but another third cousin, Eddie Siegel, who I met in Dublin, tells a slightly different story. Matthew did get to Palestine, but because of the conflicts with the Ottoman Turks and disease in that time period, he and many others escaped to Egypt, where he dies and that's where he was buried. Now, after we heard this story, just two weeks uh, after our return from the trip to Dublin, um, I heard this version on Yom Kippur at my synagogue. It, okay, when Yom Kippur, a representative from the Joint Distribution Committee was speaking, telling about the history that, that the JDC was founded in August of 1914. And on the back cover of their little pamphlet, uh, you can barely make out the date, but I think it was in 19, uh, in that time period, 1914. <clears throat> Here's one of the first appeals for fundraising to help the Jews that are suffering in Palestine. So my unconventional research process consisted of my synagogue's annual Yisker book, a Devar Torah prepared by my niece, Eva, and nephew, Eric, uh, telling some bit of the family stories. And in 2015, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of my bar mitzvah, I was able to expand on that just a, a bit uh, during, the, during that observance. Pearl to Iv Ivan, the use of jewishgen.org, utilizing the Lithuanian census info, gathering the households, and prove the other family trees were incorrect. That we'll talk about later when Ziva had sent me the, her first draft of a family tree. So in our annual Yisker book, we list various family members <clears throat> and a good number are from the Schreider family. Uh, my mother's parents, Isaac and Katie, um, uh, my mother's sister, Jean Schreider Zissiman, uh, Rachel Milikowska, who was a survivor, uh, uh, who lost the, the rest of her family in, during the Holocaust, but she was a survivor that came uh, to the U.S. and uh, retired in Philadelphia. Um, so then we can go on. So we knew a lot of Schreiders that we were trying to connect with. Now, what piqued my interest in Jewish genealogy? I came from a small family in Philadelphia with only three first cousins. Now, we have this picture, which was taken at an Israel Bond tribute uh, dinner for my parents back in May of 1972. I was a sophomore in college. Uh, standing, I'm standing, well, we'll back up, uh, David. We'll back up there, and I'm standing behind my father. To my left is my sister, Isetta, Eva's mom, and Elkin, who's familiar to most of the others here from DZBI. Um, my cousins, and now next to Elkin, is a cousin, Sharon. And on the far side is her brother, Richard. And two, and Judy Zissiman is uh, next to Richard. And uh, Marlena Shapiro, uh, um, the daughter, the one daughter of my aunt uh, and uncle, Abe and Ethel Shapiro, uh, Ethel was my father's uh, uh, sister. And in the front row, between uh, on the side of my parents, uh, was David Siegel, and then uh, my mother, sister Jean, and Louis Zissiman. Now, in this picture, there's only two people that were not born in the U.S. David Siegel, and in, in the far, or to the far right is Rachel Milikowska. Now we can go on. This was the uh, the um, program. Uh, yeah, you, hard to see it. Actually, what I, my apologies because when I first presented, this was like in a large overhead screen, so it, it was able to come through much clearer. 
Um, the, uh, the entertainment I just was Joey Adams, a uh, comedian and, and raconteur. And uh, Elkin and I remember the one thing that we, that he made a comment to us that we were dressed in our fancy tuxedos. He says, you two look like bookends. And the whole write up about my parents and they tell about the family. Okay, and I make the point, as I said, for David, who was born in Batashani, Romania in 1885. And the second row was Rachel Schreider Milikowska, okay, a survivor uh, from the town of Ashmiani, and who died in 1989 at age 78. Something that came up on my screen that's interfering. Hold a second. Okay. Um, we can then move forward. Okay, and I've already gone through this. And I just happened at the time I, I was putting this uh, whole program together, my cousin uh, Marlena had given me this uh, wedding portrait of David and Sarah Siegel taken approximately in 1905. The interesting thing was on the uh, shipping manifest, uh, it said that David Siegel was arriving at the port of Philadelphia to meet, and, and Sarah, he was going to be met by his cousin, Sarah. And that's, I'm assuming this was a second or third cousin, but that's who he married. And the grave markers for David Siegel. Um, and next is uh, Sarah. Okay. And she, okay, now we have and uh, just a few feet away from where those grave markers are for my um, a father's parents um, were the uh, a mausoleum that contained uh, the, the remains of Isaac Schreider. And just let's quickly look at the name. Reb Yitzhak Bar Moshe, okay, died in 1947 at age 62. Now, we're going to start to point out different discrepancies through this whole program, okay? Because in, on his U.S. citizenship application, he cites that he was born in 1983. If he died in 1947, that would make him 64. So there's an error of some two years. How that happened, I don't know. And uh, is Katie Sh uh, Schreider is uh, underneath. Um, and the next one shows the, the last space was for Rachel Schreider Milikowska. Okay, let's look at her name. Rachel Bat Reb Elchanan. Okay, Elchanan was her father. So the 50th anniversary of my bar mitzvah. Now, I could not have all the honors that day because there was a young boy actually celebrating his bar mitzvah. So I wrote this, um, uh, uh, you know, I started out by saying how the journey started years ago with a story that was told by Eva and Eric Stern at their B'nai Mitzvot about this Sefer Torah brought to Philadelphia by grandfather Isaac Schreider after living in Dublin. Okay, and then I expanded upon this in 2015. So this Devar Torah was delivered by me at Colin Flanagan's Bar Mitzvah. So I start out by saying to Colin's family, it may seem like the planets and moons are in alignment. And then the, let's go to the words of Torah. The second aliyah starts with a short sentence, Vayeshev Yitzhak Bigrar. And Isaac dwelled in Gerar with his wife, Rebecca. He tells the people and King Abimelech that she is his sister. Although this is a place, the Hebrew root word is Ger. You're all familiar with the story, meaning a stranger. And then I, this is the theme that I pick up on. Isaac dwelt in a strange land. This is the history of the Sefer Torah and history of one of our merged congregation's presidents. Thanks again to Eve and Eric, uh, where they, where their words were reading from this particular Torah scroll. Today symbolizes the continuity of Jewish life passed down from the Schreider Siegel family. Okay. 
this Torah belonged to the great grandfather, Moshe Schreider, who was a religious learned man, a moil and a shochet in a t small town called Ashmania, Poland or Lithuanian border area, depending on the time period. But this was actually only 30 miles from Vilna. Moshe Schreider was a widower who left Vilna a few years after his youngest, and actually, uh, correction, that it was his daughter Anna that was born in 1885, and the son Isaac was born in 1883 for the destination of Dublin, Ireland. M Moshe's brother, Matis Yahu, okay, we were saying that he was the head of Jewish education in Dublin. The correction during my travels, we found the fact that it was Matis Yahu's son, Hyman Schreider, okay, which was according to his grandson, Ed Siegel, that he was the head of Jewish education at the Zion School. And one of the young students that he tutored for his bar mitzvah was none other than Chaim Herzog. Young Isaac was educated in, in the Dublin public school. Well, correction, we were found out that there were no real public schools. There were all, all these parish schools in that area. My son, David, when I first made this presentation, and maybe Yvonne will clarify it for me, uh, that there was some form of public funding for it, but I, I don't know the details. His tenor voice allowed him to be a Baal Tefila and an admired singer in the Yiddish opera production of Shulamit, performed in Dublin in 1908. And later on, you'll see the theater review that we, that we found through Yvonne. There was a very small Jewish population of several hundred in Ireland for hundreds of years from German migration and Muranos fleeing Spain after 1492. In 1891, after a larger migration from Lithuania, the Jewish population reached 1,500 and doubled in, to 3,000 by 1901. 70% lived in Dublin. The Jewish population was only 0.04%, four hundredths of a percent in 1891. Isaac dwelt in a strange land. So the correction, we thought, thought at first that he came here in 1907. It was 1908. He was 25 at the time. So after Isaac came to Philadelphia, he attended services at the Nezner Congregation on South 2nd Street in Queen Village. When he was a father to two teenage girls, my mother Martha and her older sister Jean, he became the president of Nezner from 1927 to 1947, when he passed away at age 62, or perhaps it was 64, just one month after the end of all of the Jewish holidays. There is a bronze plaque downstairs in the Nezner Hebrew School that marks his 20 years of faithful and devoted service as president. In an immigrant community during the Great Depression, it was unique for a synagogue leader to have the language skills of Polish, Russian, Yiddish, and English with an Irish brogue. Following the merger of Nezner with Beth Zion Beth Israel in 1984, and the acquisition of their uh, Sefer Torahs, my parents arranged to repair the Torah and rededicate it with the mantle cover. And since then, four of Isaac's great-grandchildren have read from this Sefer Torah on the occasion of their B'nai Mitzvot. Fifty years ago, his grandchildren, like Elkin and I, did not have that opportunity. Today, I am about to do just that. And there's a correction that we'll see at the end of my presentation. In the cities of Ireland, Jews who migrated from Eastern Europe were able to live in relative peace. Some of us are grateful for this fact that our families had such a place to call home, a land where they were strangers but treated well before their journeys to Philadelphia. So Colin, for your benefit today, we can dub this Torah the Irish Torah. This was a, a presidential portrait taken of Isaac in his 20th year as president. The plaque that I referred to. And a close up of the uh, mantle. 
Okay. Going forward. And then there were two Rimonim that were dedicated in honor of Rachel Milikowska, the our Holocaust survivor and, and cousin. And the other is it, as it says, in memory of Honen. Honen is the abbreviated form of the name Elchanan. That, that was her father, Gittel, her mother, Koppel Schreider, her brother, her two children, Sarah and Masha Milikowska, and her husband. Lippa Milakovsky. Also downstairs in the Nezner Hebrew School, there is a, another plaque from uh, Nezner of Joseph Schreider. This was uh, uh, Isaac's older brother who came here in about 1900. And again, you see there, Yosef Bar Moshe. Now here's the... Um, census from 1910 and on the next page you won't be able to see it but above the highlighted the highlighted portion lists all of the Shriders so in 1910 Isaac the very last one there is living with his brother Joseph the wife Bessie and two of the first two of their children Sam Schrider and Morris Schrider A Schreider family crest. Uh, maybe about three years ago, Marsh and I were uh, enjoying an afternoon out at Peddler's Village in one of these novelty shops. They say, uh, look up the family name and we can create the family crest. And I assured the uh, operator of the store, we, we didn't have a family crest. So he immediately said, well, for our Jewish customers, we can put the uh, Israeli flag and Jewish symbols around. And I said, well, that works perfectly for me. And taking a close up, we see that the name Schreider means to cut. So remember, we mentioned before, for Eva and Eric had mentioned that M Moshe Schreider was a moil and a shochet. And, and, and their fathers and grandfathers before them were probably in the same occupation and that's why they had taken that family name. Remember, it was, if I remember the history, someone could correct me, it was upon the Napoleonic era, uh, era that people started to adopt family names. Okay, Pearl Roz to Yvonne. Sometimes research just falls into your lap. Two college students years ago, I believe, can correct me, Yvonne, at UC Berkeley. Pearl was a study partner with me in the Musar program. And when I shared my Devar Torah with her in 2015, she told me, I must send this to her old college friend, Yvonne Altman O'Connor in Dublin. Well, who's Yv Yvonne? She is the vice chair of the Irish Jewish Museum. And Marsh and I got to meet her in uh, the summer of 2018. And through her efforts, this led me to connect with the, another third cousin and who we met in, in that time period uh, with Marsha. And we have a picture of Eddie, full name Ian Edward Siegel. He was the last Schrider in Dublin. The picture of us in the car, and then Eddie Siegel with Marsha Siegel as we were touring around the area and before we went for a, a lunch. Uh, the two of us in front of the Irish Jewish Museum. And here was just a, we have like a one minute or so video clip of the time we went to lunch. So you get a, a, just a taste of this character that I refer to as Eddie Siegel. He, he was a true delight. Hope this comes through, David. Hi, this family. Ira and Marsha are in Dublin, in Ireland, enjoying our vacation. And we've had the pleasure of meeting today with a cousin, Ed Siegel, 
who's a real delight, and we're going to turn the camera on him so that you can get a touch of the Irish humor, the, the Irish brogue, and the story of the Shriders, the story of the Shriders in Dublin. So here we go, Ed. Hi, people. Eddie Siegel is my name. Uh, I'm a cousin of Iris, although he asked me never to say that in public. And um, we uh, spent a wonderful day together. He's so full of information. His research is so good. And we're in Dunleary at the moment, which is a resort outside Dublin. And we're just having a little bite to eat. So my regards to all family, all Shriders, and all, 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 all the tabs and affiliated people. And I wish you well. Oh, well, you're going to have to say more. Yeah, more. Yeah. I have to say Feel more. Feel free. That's right. Yes. Be, feel free to uh, so, um, um, find me. Um, 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 um. Can you switch off for a second? Can I switch off? For a second. Just for a second. Let me think a second. Okay. So we were lucky to, that that was the short video. We had a much longer video, but we're not going to play that in, in this uh, presentation. Um, moving forward, David. Okay, uh, not, we're not playing it again. Okay, the next one was eight minutes. We're not listening to that. Sadly, again, I had just received word from Yvonne in January of this year that Eddie uh, passed away. So the lesson to all of us is that uh, who are look, working that we are working against a clock when it comes to Jewish genealogy research. Eddie was a real character. He was also a longtime vice president of the Hevra Kadisha of Dublin, and he took us to the Dolphins Barn Orthodox Cemetery. The punchline, of course, is he really knew where the bodies were buried. We saw the few Schreider graves, but could not find the actual one for my great-grandfather, Moses Schreider. Fortunately, Eddie previously had taken a picture and it was on his cell phone, but he also said they always wondered who Moses Schreider was. This was the picture that he had taken. Um, the key thing, uh, the, the translation of the next page was that uh, a righteous man who extremely feared God, Moshe, Ben Reb Shemariahu Schreider. Now, according to S. Rosenblatt, we'll explain about him later on, uh, dies January 5th, 1908, at the age of 63. And on the, this, the grave marker, it says, from the city of As Asmina. Okay? So by the math, he would have been born in 1844. In, in Jewish genealogy, you have to learn how to read these monuments because they'll tell you the father's names, of course, and in some cases actually cite the city where they come from. Now, there were five Shriders buried in Dolphin's Barn. Uh, from the bottom up is Moses. Uh, Hannah Minutcha Shrider, she was the wife of this uh, Matis Yahu. She passed away in 1903, 10 years before he embarked on his trip. Uh, Hyman Schreider and his wife Tilly. And then there's an Annie Schreider. And from the genealogy information, we're, we know that Moshe got remarried when he was in Dublin, but we don't really see the connection. So it's something that we haven't proved whether, because the dates don't match up in terms of she was previously married and so forth. So un unanswered questions at this point. This was Hyman Schreider. And the next page was just a close up of the name where it's Chaim Shamari. Again, giving um, reference to the, his grandfather, the Shamari Ahu. Okay. A Tilly Schreider. Now, moving to jewishgen.org, the research that I was able to do there. So in the Jewish Gen Family Finder, my first two connections over a period of time with researchers 
was this Ziva Alicia, okay, and then this Monroe Price, who were looking for Shriders from the town of, a different spelling here, of Ashmiani, but they knew it was Belarus. Now, after these two, there are several other researchers for Shriders from various other towns, um, and there's just a number of them that I haven't been able to spend any time as at this point in time looking uh, for their connections in the next uh, slide or two, David. Okay. So, but, but then it's interesting, there are Schraders that go to Manchester, England. So a lot of the Schraders, uh, you know, the children's and grandchildren that were born in Dublin, they then migrated to the UK. Um, so there's quite possibly uh, connections there. And, and it continues, but there's still more for me to go through. Okay, now we're just moving on. Okay, so now on Jewish Gen, you get to pull up in this case, the Lithuanian um, census data. And what I was able to do was take each line of information with you know census entry um, uh, data entry, and then moved it into a spreadsheet where I started to pull together what I would call the uh, household, the Schrider households. Uh, the, the next page, uh, David. Okay, and tried to put in all of the information that I could uh, copy from this uh, this census data. And I eventually had a page, you know, spreadsheet, you know, going several pages long, identified households one, two, three, it, it went up to more than a dozen. And then using a Microsoft Visio product that I had at work you know, for a short period of time, um, I started to pull together a family tree. And I, I'm not one that likes the actual family trees that are on all these different sites. So in essence, I was making my own. I was able to go back at the top level to see a Kaivel, a Kiva, uh, born sometime in the 1780s. Um, then going across, it seemed like there were brothers. Now, at first, it's the printed words there are Gilel. But then I had a friend who attended my uh, presentation five months ago. He says, well, Ira, there's no H because there's no H in the Russian language, that Gilel is actually Hillel, okay? And then all to the far side, there's a Leib and a Liba. Okay, now, these, those branches for the second and third, they stop after a period of time. There are notations in, in the census data that says they were transferred to another location or you know, left, left, it, it didn't use the nice phrase of, the, well, they left the town on their own accord. Uh, so we, there's branches there that we haven't been able to follow. But what I've highlighted here, and, and David, I'm not sure if you can zoom in. Uh, it's, it's our first attempt here. That we get to Shmerko, which we feel is the Shemariahu. And he has two I'm sorry, three sons and two daughters, okay? The first one that was born was M M Matthew or Matisyahu. Then he has a, a daughter, Leah. Then comes Benjamin Schreider, followed by Moshe, my great-great-grandfather. And then a daughter, Fre uh, Freda, who, sh who must have passed away at a very early age because when Benjamin gets married, his first daughter is named Fredel. And from there, I, I started to prove some of the points that yes, Shemariahu, there we go, great. Okay, Shemariahu or the Shmerko was the father of all of these branches, okay? So we, we know that who went to Dublin, Matis Yahu and Moshe, okay? And the branches that we found with the Ziva was the branch that went to uh, Palestine in 1925, okay? 
and the remainders uh, who wound up the, the, the son. So it, here's the interesting thing. Moshe had a number of children. Joseph was the oldest. He served for a while in the Russian army. So he was away for a time. Elchanan, and this was, uh, this was the brother of Isaac. He decided, I don't know what the reason was, to stay in the town, whereas all of the other family members had left the town. Okay, so we can go on to the next slide. Because you gotta get it back to the regular size and then advance. <laughs> there you go, okay. And it goes on for two or three pages. Again, unconventional approach, uh, using my own design of family tree, uh, pulling links together. Okay. Um, and I, we can skip this. Okay. And skip that as well. Okay. Now, Ziva, 10 years ago when we first uh, made, uh, 11 years ago when we first connected, she sends me a family tree that in essence collapsed two generations because her rendition was Shamariahu was the father of Elchanan, okay? Now, why that mistake was made? Well, because if all the other children had left town and Elchanan was the only one remaining there to take care of his father, actually, my mistake, his grandfather, they, that's where the error occurred. Okay, and then, so this is her tree of Benjamin uh, Schreider with the uh, links to the daughter Hannah, who marries an Abraham Devere. Okay, and then have these children, the, the, the Caspies, Ziva, Dina, and then there's a brother, David Caspi, who I've not yet met. Okay. There's also in jewishgen.org an interactive um, family tree of Hyman Schreider uh, that talks about the various branches. And some of the uh, people from the top line uh, that we had met in prior years, when they were in the Boston area. And actually, that was a key part because they were able to take care of Rachel after she came to the U.S., uh, they looked after her for the years until she retired and, and came to Philadelphia. I think it was in the mid 70s. More family members. And then right here in the middle, uh, one of the sons of uh, Hyman is through this Judah, or the daughter, Judith Schreider. And that's where you, we find Ian, Edward Siegel, and then uh, two sisters. And then there's a, a, a David uh, Siegel who is in uh, Toronto. Okay, now another third cousin is Mayor Rudner and his daughter Yael, who I spent time with in Haifa. Now, I had met uh, Mayor on the two or three occasions when I traveled to Israel in the past as a college student um, and actually on, on our honeymoon. And but never, uh, he, he actually, after surviving, uh, he married late in life. And yeah, Yael was the oldest daughter and, uh, and her sister, uh, Iris. Um, but the key point here is he was a 12 year old boy who witnessed the roundup of the men of Ashmiana on a Shabbat afternoon after services. Okay. It, at Yad Vashem, I was able to get a, a, the transcript of his oral testimony a 59-page document. Well, unfortunately for me, it was all in Hebrew. So I got to, through efforts of a friend of mine to translate this transcript and they put it, they recast it in story form. And it's also one of the documents that uh, David had sent out. Uh, and I believe it's, I think you posted it to the uh, chat room. Okay, so from the translation, Okay, Mayer was born in December 1928, which was Poland at the time. Until 1939, it was a majority Jewish city. It had between seven to 8,000 residents, so most of whom were Jewish, yeah, more than 
The Jews were in commerce and other jobs like tailors, shoemakers, etc. Okay, the, the Jews were originally from Lithuania. Again, as I said, Vilna was only some 30 miles away. Um, they, they observed the Shabbat, their stores would be closed. A lot of the Goyim or the Gentiles, they spoke Yiddish in the city. Okay. Um, now, here was something interesting that I had no insight of until I was able to read this translation. Mayer's father had a little fabric store, and in the evenings, he was an accountant at a leather factory. Go on. Mayer was 11 years old. It, it tells the story here of what happened in September 1939. Uh, but they, okay. And the Russians closed all the stores, and Mayer's family began living from their savings from the shop and his father's accounting business. Okay. Okay. And then, um, you know, so he just tells what happened. He, the, when the Germans, when the Germans finally came, actually, not, not in 1939. Okay. We'll get to that point later on. But in 1941, because they had the agreement with the Russians, General Molotov, I, I believe it was, um, that they were t taking care of policing, in essence, that town area. That there was a Russian uh, army base in that town. Okay, but when the Germans came in June of 1941, they arrested the rabbi who was considered the head of the congregation. They took 150 or so Jews took them away, nobody knew where they went to, okay? Um, but on Shabbat 1941, the SS unit, the, the I, um, special name that it's referred to, came to the town and gathered all the Jews, okay? And including his father, and he, a discrepancy, because he says there's 800 men who were led outside the city to it, the city named the Bertel. Witnesses shared that all of them were killed after digging their own graves. This was the death by bullets action in the early years of World War II. Okay, so one of the, um, the key things that uh, Mayer uh, had told me through uh, Yael was that his mother had sensed when the notice went out that everyone was, was to gather in the town in the town square that shabbat afternoon okay she sensed uh, after services she sensed something was wrong and she told her 12 year old son do not go to synagogue this day go to go to your friend's house and it was a home that was around the town square so from the second floor window he's witnessing this roundup of all the men Okay. Um, when he went to visit the town in 2001, he, he finds the ruins of the synagogue that became a bottle storage place. And the Jewish cemetery was dirty and neglected. So he and his Israeli friends decided to put a fence around it for people to realize it is a special Jewish place. So here is this memorial marker that cites to remember the 1200 Jews that were killed on the date was July 26, 1941. But in actuality, the Hebrew date, okay, is Bibet, Be'av, the second of Av, which when we were setting up this date and I had realized the connection, I realized I would be presenting this on the Yurt site, and this is prior before we move into the Ma'ariv service, you know, when it's done at 8.30, or candle lighting's at 8.04. So I asked, um, is Rabbi Annie with us? Yes, she is. To take, a, take us for a few minutes to um, allow us to have her say the El Mole Rachamin for these 12, because this was the, the town our ancestors came from, and I'm calling on Annie now, to, and you are muted, so unmute. Okay. Um, 
Thank you, Ira, for lifting up the memory of your beloved ones who, who died um, for binding their souls up in the bonds of life by telling their stories and passing on this Torah of your family and these sacred stories. So I'm going to chant an El Malay um, Rachamim for them. Um, just one second. <laughs> Yeah, Yo, Yosef, where's Yosef? <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, um, El Shochen Bamromi Kedoshim utehorim Kezor harakia mazirim Lenishmort kol ele Sheis karnu hayom libracha Kopel ben Elchanan Lipa Malakovsky Shmuel Alter Rudner. Shehalhu le'olamam Began Eden Tehi menuchatam Ana balarachamim Hastire Nafecha le olamim Utsror bitsror achaim Et nishmotem Adonai unachalatam Meyanuchu v'shalom Al mishkavotehem v'nomar amen. Thank you so much, Annie. That was beautiful. So let me now uh, continue uh, with that next slide. So we're okay. Moving on. Dave, David, it's uh, do I have to touch anything? There we go. So we had uh, mentioned what, what happened upon his visit in 2001. Um, going forward. Okay, well, I think we're going backwards. So let's go forward. Okay, there, there we go. This was a picture that he took of the great synagogue of, in Ashmiani in 2001. Okay, but we're going to show you a link at the very end that there's colored photos of the interior because they, the government decided they're going to try to restore the synagogue. It's one of those, you know, as many of the synagogues in Eastern Europe had beautiful artwork in the ceilings. So wait, wait for that. Okay. And the same structure was pictured in this Yisker book. Okay, also some pictures taken by Mayer in 2001 consisted of, you know, he had all the descriptions in Hebrew, so I'm jotting down all my notes. Is what he explained, this was the alley, alleyway that was next, uh, that led to the synagogue next to a pharmacy. And, and here is a picture of a shoe store that was run by Elchanan Schneider and a Mr. Levinson, his business partner. Mayer was visiting the cemetery in Ashmiani, but certainly in need of better uh, upkeep because it's been non-existent. 
Yael shared the story uh, that his father can recall the tenor, the tenor voice of Elchanan Schreider when he led services. The story goes that the non-Jewish police officer would come to the service just to hear him sing. Elchanan was a member of the municipal council and a store owner. Okay. Um, now, they were cousins as well as next door neighbors. Okay, now a bit of a story uh, of a conflict because uh, Mayer says he witnessed, again, his father being rounded up and Elchanan, who he was uh, familiar with. But our family story says that Elchanan suffered a heart attack after the Nazi invasion in September 1939. And after he had received, finally, a visa to come to the U.S. But that was granted by the State Department in August of 1939, but he could not leave in time. And he had realized that he waited too long and could not save his family. And actually, the Yurtzeit dates, because we knew that couple today was couple Schreiter's Yurtzeit, but um, Elchanan is a different date. So when Rachel came here, you know, through my mother's efforts, they, they probably had, you know, based her on Rachel's recollection. Okay. Um, we can then uh, skip over. We've covered some of this before. Okay. Um, and again, this is reciting the, the history of the, the dates that they invaded in June. Okay, and then they round up the men and shot them on July 26. Okay, oh, this was the story that um, when the announcement went out to all the men would come after services, it was only those men 16 and above. And that's what I was referring to uh, Mayer's mother. She said something was wrong. She, that's what she said. Don't even go to services, even though they don't want you, you're too young. Okay, now the remaining women and children were removed from the town in September 1941. They first went to this ghetto in the uh, Vilna area, but then they were sent to a series of work camps, slave labor camps. And in the Yisker book, and actually just quickly uh, sh show you that this is the Yisker book. I think the Rachel had purchased this. This has a lot of the information that I was able to gather to tell the story. And we see that there are only three Shriders here. Hanan, and remember the shorter form of Elchanan, Gitzel, his wife, and Koppel. Okay, Elchanan Schreider was one of seven Jewish council members. And here they, they are listing uh, the last part of this, uh, like fifth paragraph, as H Hana Schreider. Okay. There was also a, um, a, the vice mayor of the town. Now just, again, I've made this point before. This was a population of 50% Jews. They were, in the, they were in the government, so to speak, or the, the town council, even though it was a small town. But that did not create the safe environment for them when the Germans came. Here's a picture of the Gemilut Chesed Committee. Elchanan Schreider is seated third from the left side, that, and this was confirmed by Meir Rudner. There were Milikovs 28 Milikovskis, but there was no listing for Lippa, Rachel's um, uh, husband. Ra there's a Rachel, but we're not, we, there must be another Rachel, and we're not sure that both of the girls were listed. This was the great synagogue and interior shot that says Chazan Milakovsky. Now Elchanan Schreider was a Shaliach Tzibur. So was our, my guess is this is how Rachel got connected to Alipa Milakovsky. The synagogue was constructed in 1902, long after Matis Yahu and Moshe Schreider had left for Dublin. And um, just to point out, when Mayer was looking at this picture, okay, he was very sad because his first reaction says, they're all gone. Because it was taking him back to that point of all of these familiar 
uh, faces from the synagogue that he always attended services. The Rudners, uh, and they point out here, even though there's three names, there's actually only two because Shmuel and Alter were one and the same person. Okay, so sometimes these errors uh, are, are just there. Okay, uh, this was earlier census information from 1847 and, and 1897. Uh, just a note that I made, that was a 52% Jewish population. The musical voices of my family. Elchanan Schreider was a Shaliach Sibor, okay? His brother Isaac sang in the Yiddish opera in Dublin. When I attended the Shabbat services in Dublin and listened to the congregation's president make announcements with an Irish brogue, it was the closest that I could imagine hearing Isaac make announcements as president of the Nesner congregation. Rachel's uh, story. She lost her father, mother, brother, husband, and two little daughters, one from one girl from an illness and the other shot by a German soldier. She was very much shattered by this the whole experience and who could blame her? Yet she survived as a worker, slave labor, okay, and came to the US via Canada. Worked in Boston for many years and uh, looked after by re relatives there and retired in Philadelphia and was well, care well cared for. So when she would meet someone, she would pull you close and start telling the story. In with a thick accent. In 1939, the Nazis came, and then she would throw up her hands without being able to utter another word. So at Yad Vashem this past summer, the archivist pulled Rachel's records from the International Tracing Service that told the story of the multiple work camps that she was assigned to. I was surprised to hear how she was in a work camp outside of Riga, Latvia. On a teen tour, a US, uh, USY tour to Russia in 1970 as a high school graduate, we went to Salas Pills work camp outside of Riga. I could never imagine how close this was to where Rachel suffered and survived. I was hugging this archivist for telling the story that we never heard. Next page is this document, okay? And this tells what well, she was in, eight, in 41, 42, the period of time between 43 to June of 44, and then following the war and then listed as a DP, a displaced person, January 47. I, there was a stop here for, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back, David. I want to stop here for a point. There was an article this morning about a, uh, in Germany, a guard, a Nazi guard was, uh, was tried for being a guard at Stutthof, okay? And that just name, you know, jumped out at me because that's where I had seen this name before. So now we can go forward. Uh, at my wedding in 82, Rachel, uh, sitting uh, to the far left, um, was with three other first cousins, Sam uh, Schreider and his wife Rose, and Rini Schreider. And on the far right side is Jean Zessiman. Moving forward. And at, at Rachel, uh, at my sister's wedding in 78, with five other first cousins, Sam and Rini, the two children of Joseph Schreider, and seated was Rachel uh, next to my Aunt Jean, my mom, and Ray Balkin, who was the daughter of Anna Schreider, who married this Joseph Heyman in Dublin and then moved to Glasgow, Scotland. Okay. Now, what was frustrating when we started to look at the genealogy information in, in Dublin was that there were very few listings in, of Moses Schreider and maybe only one of Isaac where he was a witness for his sister's wedding. 
we'll pick up uh, moving. Okay, and we're going to sh show you who authored all of this, this all this detail. Okay, we'll move forward. Uh, we see from the uh, marriage license that they were living at Oakfield House. Now, number two, this was on Anna, Anna's marriage record to Joseph Heyman. This, unfortunately, this house uh, building seems to be in quite a state of disrepair, has seen better days. But it's in a neighborhood of these small little houses that go for some 400 to 500,000 500 euros. And I knew this from uh, encountering a real estate agent as, she, as he was taking in the sale sign. Okay, the next picture which shows the block. And then beyond that are some uh, uh, four story uh, uh, homes. Okay, more uh, uh, entry in these books. We're not going to certainly read through all these. Okay, we'll keep uh, advancing. In the, in the Irish Jewish Museum, now we'll get to uh, Yvonne, uh, is this model of a typical kitchen with a table set for Shabbat. Um, okay, so Yvonne showed us several posters of Yiddish opera performances and said she would continue to research this opera, Shulamit. Family relatives long ago told the story of the women in the balcony calling out Isaac, Isaac after his performances. So I certainly assume that this was a performance at some synagogue or town hall where the ladies were in the balcony. And here's Yvonne again showing us town hall. And then this uh, next picture is another Yiddish production in 1932 of the Schlenke Tramp, taking after um, Charlie Chaplin, I believe. Okay, another poster. Okay. All right, so meanwhile, Marsh and I went to the theater to see this play, Jimmy's Hall, at the Abbey Theater. Now, this is not the original building. This was, uh, that original building had burned down, but this was the uh, more um, recreated Abbey Theater. She was posing by this portrait of William Yates. And it says that he, William Butler Yates, was the co-founder of the Abbey Theater a playwright. And on Marsha's night table, I find that she always kept this book of the poems of Yeats. So two months after our return, Yvonne sent us some more information concerning the Yiddish opera productions in Dublin. Okay, that talks about the 1908 performances that four years after the opening of the Abbey Theatre. And the bottom paragraph, the first performance um, took place in, in the end of June 1908. The newly formed Jewish Amateur Opera and Dramatic Society performed Shulamit. And it shows in the theater review. Uh, the, but the PDF that Yvonne had sent me was a composite of uh, two different types of reviews. And why do I say that? Because two separate parts, they're talking about the two individuals who were listed as performing Avi Shalom, the Maccabee warrior. So this was just like a high school production with alternating lead performers on different nights. There was a Mr. L. Briscoe, who's related to the future Jewish Lord Mayor of Dublin, a picture of which was in the, the book by uh, Stanley Price, taken in 1957. And on his grave uh, marker, he's listed as serving as Lord Mayor on, on two occasions. Okay, and it goes on and, and okay. And then on the next page, actually skipping, uh, okay. Um, yep. And the second was Mr. I. Schreider. Okay, the part of Avi Shalom was finally rendered by Mr. I. Schreider. Okay. Move, move on. Okay. Um, I see this little reference that they're talking about Avi Sholem's Negro slave, and I, I can't imagine that they have blackface in the Yiddish theater productions. But this was 1908. Um, and now I'll just 
to point out that Yvonne just sent me two days ago, she has a more current academic research uh, paper that talks about the history of the Yiddish theater. And it's mentioning, I, I believe it mentioned Isaac again, and certainly the uh, uh, Shulamit. And I have to go through that, <laughs> okay? Then she also made reference that when we first met with her, that was there was a record of petty court filing on December 30th, 1907. And then the fact that Moses passed away on January 8th of 1908. And we were worried, what did Isaac do that might have contributed to his father Moshe's passing? But she promised that she would get some information. And two months later, she, she finally corrected the misunderstanding that... Uh, he was filing a papers for a, um, a renewal of a business license. Okay, but that was reported in the uh, petty court filings. And as she says near the bottom, so um, we had him wrongly incriminated. Okay, now we're moving on. The, the petty court record. And a missing person. So there, as I said earlier, there was frustration that very few records identified Isaac and Moshe during their time in Dublin. Stuart Rosenblatt was this genealogist who pulled together all of this information in, in these volumes and we we're gonna see in a minute. But in the US, Isaac is recorded in the 1910 census living with his brother Joseph, but he's not listed. He escapes the 1920 and the 1930 census uh, reappearing in 1940. Okay, the marriage license for Anna, where Isaac is one of the witnesses. Okay, we can move on. Uh, so it was gratifying to see this published, the theater review of Shulamit with Isaac as the rotating lead star to show that he had some footprint in, the, uh, in Dublin. Okay, then we come to his uh, declaration of intention to become a US citizen. And he, they're providing all this information. Again, discrepancy. He's saying that the date was he was born in eight, 1883, came to Philadelphia in 1908, okay, on this SS Marion, uh, a boat which was sunk during World War I. Okay, moving on. Um, we'll, we'll move on. Okay. Um, so, okay, we made this point. Ah, we missed something. Ah, okay. There was backup one. No, okay. David had uh, deleted some things. There was a business card of the Schrider um, um, uniform store um, that was selling dry goods on the second street. And there was one um, glaring, uh, it seemed another discrepancy. The business card says that this was founded in 1906, if I recall correctly, okay? But we said, wait a second, Isaac came to Philadelphia in 1908 in the census in 1910, he's living with Joseph. He marries Katie sometime after the 1910 census. It was Katie Schreider, uh, Katie Lichtenstein, Katie uh, Heron, uh, who started the business. So she was indeed an early female entrepreneur. We're moving on, uh, we'll go on. This we talked about the death certificate. We'll move on, and so this is Stuart Rosenblatt, who's 21 volume of, bo of books in the National Archives. In the next page, take up two shelves uh, in that uh, archives, and that's where I spend the better part of two days copying, you know, photographing these different uh, entries. Okay all of these books and for each of the cities for dublin for cork for belfast uh even limerick okay there was the lady from nantucket okay the the a to z dna of irish jewry and by the way there are some copies of these uh, volumes that are in that are housed at the uh, jewish museum so we were seeing it in, in two locations okay we can move forward Okay, a birth register, right? an unusual source of information is from Ada Schulman, who is part of the uh, uh, leading up to the marriage of, um, oh, uh, well, related to Hyman Schreider, but from the, on the mother's side, she was a midwife who kept meticulous records 
that's an unusual source for a Jewish genealogy. This is a picture of the Irish Jewish Museum, opened by President Chaim Herzog in June of 85. The Hyman Schreider, uh, mentioned before, prepared him for his bar mitzvah. This is just a, took a part of a walking tour I took through this old neighborhood. It, this was called a wood quay, and all these small little houses, that's, that's where the Jewish community, uh, the synagogues are that there, uh, no longer exist. In, in fact, the Irish Jewish Museum was the house of one of these small synagogues. The synagogues have moved to the uh, more suburban areas over time. Here's a, a real estate listing, 575,000 euros. I think the next one was even showing 1.1 million. You have to look uh, uh, closely. Okay. So what finally convinced Z cousin Ziva of the family relationship? My research su suggesting her family tree was incorrect did not prove the point. The picture of Moshe Schreider's monument showing Moshe Bar Shemariahu did not prove the point. When I showed her this image from the Ashmiana Yaskurt book of a hand-drawn map by a survivor of the town, and here's a picture and I've highlighted what is this Vilna Street, which was to the left side of the synagogue and that on off the, the town square, Ziva exclaimed, ah, Vilna Street, now I know we are related because her grandmother always spoke of growing up on Vilna Street. And here is a picture from this Yisker book of this Vilna Street. The Schreiders in Philadelphia area in 2019, we gathered at the home of Adam Zisserman to have a bit of a Hanukkah party. And as unusual, we're all together here. Judy, uh, who's, who's on the call with her daughter-in-law and two children. So I was reminded of a comment made to me some <clears throat> 12 years ago from a violist that I was sharing stories with at a simcha. My stories have such symmetry. So now I knew how to close this presentation. I said, what was, what was she trying to say in, in, that, in the meaning of symmetry? So I looked it up, okay. So a correction, it was not just reading from this Sefer Torah at my 50th anniversary of my bar mitzvah, but I came to realize this past year that I also read from this Torah on Rosh Hashanah, the Maftir Aliyah, which I have done for many years. But our Gabbai, Virginia Green, assured me that we rarely use this safer Torah precisely because it is so heavy. But this is what I noticed this past Rosh Hashanah. The Maftir Aliyah that is read from this very day. Okay, the Yom Teruah, the day of blowing the shofar. Okay, the remainder of them moving on. The Maftir Aliyah honor, who was called to the second Torah, Okay, and who will chant the Haftorah portion for the first day of Rosh Hashanah, and who is here today goes to Elkin Siegel, who reads from the first book of Samuel, chapter one, talking about the man Elkanah, who had the two wives, Penina and Hannah. And in so doing, we both continue to honor our Schreider family's heritage with this Irish Torah. Okay. And we'll just take, the, the, if you can click on David, there's just the one uh, first hyperlink. If we're able to. Yeah. Okay. This I, I, this I found after my presentation five months ago, it was this um, effort to um, preserve this uh, synagogue. And if we're not lucky, we I know we've come to <laughs> the end of the allotted time. So I quickly have to, uh, that may not work. So I'm gonna have to quickly look at the chats. Um, okay. Um, can I see, sir? Do you have information on when the Torah was written or when and why the, your family acquired it? Um, Virginia was the one that said, well, this was a tower from Russia, but that could have meant Lithuania's. And if they were 30 miles from Vilna, 
they probably, there was a number of uh, uh, sofares. And uh, I didn't get to read the other message, Eva, <laughs> you have to tell me. Um, so that answers the Carmi. Um, and why did they acquire? Well, and, and in fact, um, uh, Rabbi Muslia had shared with me several times, well, you know, all learned men, they had their own safer Torahs because um, Rabbi Muslia you know, had told me that he had his own Torah when he came from India. Okay, so, so did we, we didn't get that open, uh, David, did we? That link? If not, uh, if not, we, we can dispense with that. Okay. Yes, okay, now if you scroll down, okay, that's the ceiling shot that they, uh, one of the reasons why they wanted to preserve this synagogue, the, the intricate design of these European synagogues. That's, so I was just thrilled to see that ew, all the other pictures were pretty much uh, black and white. This was a color to, to show what it was like in this town uh, at the time of, um, uh, of the Holocaust. Okay, and with that, I thank you for all being uh, with me tonight. And I hope that this may inspire all of you to, um, you know, seek out your family uh, connections. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Ira. Uh, I, can I show a visual aid? I, found, I just found a photo. Yes. First of all, thank you. That was so beautiful and, and a beautiful testament to our family and, and Jewish tradition. And, um, and I just found a picture I wanted to share because you mentioned that um, Moshe was um, a shochet and a moil, both a, a ritual slaughterer of, of many kinds. And I think, Uncle Elkin, you have the actual knives, I believe, in your, uh, in, oh, yes. in your, in your basement, I think. But I just I found a picture that I wanted to share Oh, wait, this is the wrong one. Sorry, one no, second. Eva. <laughs> but Eva, we're going to be running out of time because I know the Marif menu will be at 8.30 oh, on, a, on a different Zoom link. Oh, so. <laughs> okay. I just have it in you're gonna, you're gonna send You're going to send it to me, all right? And we'll love to see that. So. Oh, it's right here. I got it. It was in a different pile. This is the picture. And it's of Bubby, um, of, of yes. Ira's uh, mother, my grandmother. And you can see she's holding uh, the knives. Right. Oh, well, yes. Yes. I remember that uh, whole, whole display. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's Thank all. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, all right. Okay. So um, I uh, hope Thank everybody you, enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Okay. It was wonderful. Really great okay. to see you all. Right. Oh, it's so good said, to see you. I don't know. Did the Pearl jo join because she said she was? I, I, I didn't get to go through the list. A quick lesson about being present in the synagogue. My grandparents had a store at seven thirty. My our grandparents had a store at seven thirty-seven South Second. Yeah, that that, that was the seven 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 South Second. That's why we treasure for twenty years. Because, <laughs> you know, that'd be a lesson. Don't live next to the synagogue. You get stuck. Right. Okay. Yeah. Don't, don't okay. serve as president for so problem. long. <laughs> okay. Two year terms, two year terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> three, right. at, three at the most, please. That right. was okay. wonderful, Ira. Yeah. That was absolutely well, wonderful. Okay. Really Thank great. you. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. All right. Nice so, you. Know, David, you're going to disconnect please. us, uh, okay, to go I, to um, the minion. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm sorry that we have to. And this okay. for the minion. Uh, I wish we could go on, Ira. That was really wonderful. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm glad I had, I had okay. this platform to present it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well done, Ira. Bye bye. Hi, up. Bye bye. Hi, I do. Hi. Hi. Judy. Hi, Ira. Hi, Hi. All right. All right. Hey. Goodbye. Be well. Bye bye. Okay. Of course, everybody. Okay.